Okay, can everyone hear me all right? Someone send out a thumbs up or something? Okay, great, 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 great. All right, thank you. So, um, welcome. Thank you for all joining us today um, for the H virtual HMSC research seminar. Uh, my name is Yi Chung Chung. I'm the academic programs manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center here in Newport, Oregon. And I will be your host of today's talk. Um, just a couple of logistics I would like to go over with everyone. Uh, please have your mics, cameras, and screen share off. Uh, and we ask that you keep them off for this event. Uh, please ask any questions you might have using the chat box found at the bottom of your screen at any time. And we will answer any questions at the end of this talk. We will be recording this event and it will be posted in a few days on the HMSC website past uh, websites past seminar page. Um, and I'll put the link in the chat uh, following this. Um, and I would also like to announce uh, next week's seminar speaker, uh, Diana Melville is a PhD student, PhD student uh, and Eric Mitch uh, from who is a faculty uh, person at University of Aruba. And they'll be talking about capacity building for sustainable development in small island states through science and technology, research and education. So uh, if you need, want to remind folks that if you need more info or the links to our upcoming events, uh, check, out, check out the HMSC homepage and scroll to the bottom for more details. Uh, put link in the uh, I'll put the link in the chat. All right, thank you. And so, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Lori Whitecamp. Uh, she is a research fisheries biologist with NOAA. Uh, she's been a, uh, a research fisheries biologist at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center since 1992, moving from the Mont Lake Laboratory to the Newport Re uh, Research Station in 2004. Lori led the West Coast Coho Salmon Status Review, the Scientific Basis for U.S. Endangered Species Act, uh, the, uh, the U.S. Endangered Species Act listing and continues to contribute to updates for ESA listed salmon populations. Lori's par primary research interests concern the estuarine and marine ecology of Pacific salmon and anadromous lampreys and the factors that affect their survival. Lori holds three degrees from the University of Washington, a bachelor's in zoology, a master's in fisheries, and a PhD in aquatic and fisheries science. Her current research um, is, uh, Lori is actively involved in research on salmon in estuarine and marine waters of the Northern California current and on the high seas. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce, uh, welcome Lori uh, to the screen. And I will do that here. Okay. Lori, can you hear me? Hmm. Excuse me for one moment. As I'm standing here in the library seminar room at Hatfield, that I was actually the last speaker to give a live talk back in March, five months ago. And why, how things have changed since then. So my talk today, as uh, Chong probably said, is really about lamprey, uh, biology conservation, and some brand new green ecology data that we're generating. And with this talk, I really just wanted to pass upon you how cool lamprey really are and 
that ugh, factor that most people get is really not appropriate. Um, and I should also say that my name is on here, but I have this at all, that there's a lot of people that have been helping me with this, uh, gathered data, et cetera. And, but before I do that, I just wanted a quick civics lesson in that I work for the federal government, uh, NOAA Fisheries. Hang on, reach down. Maybe if I have the pointer on, I can't. Let's do next. Sorry about that. This is gonna be Ooh. Ah. Okay, there's always something. Turn the pointer on. Let's see, I can't forward. You try the now, yeah, try uh, down, down, let me do this. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm not sure why. <laughs> Hopefully that's not a problem. Okay. Uh, so I work for NOAA Fisheries, which is part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, NOAA's mission is science, service, and stewardship, and our vision is resilient ecosystems, communities, and Economies, and I wanted to impress upon you, if that were, um, how many, how much of NOAA there is in the Hatfield area here in Newport. Uh, there's a variety of line offices or for different uh, factions within NOAA. Uh, the things that are in bold here are ones that are here at Hatfield. So I work for the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, which is part of NOAA Fisheries, but we also have people here from the Alaska Center, the Southwest Center. There's a tide gauge that's run by the Oceans, uh, National Ocean Service that's just uh, probably 100 yards away from where I'm standing. There's buoys offshore that are run by the National Weather Service. We also have the ships here in uh, Newport, and there's people from the PMEL, so quite a presence in Newport. And I mentioned this at all, that there's a lot of people who are working on this project with me, and these are really some of the key players in this. So the top row are all people who work for NOAA Fisheries, either the Northwest Fisheries Science Center or the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, in the case of uh, Louise, who go out on ships and, and work with people who uh, collect data. Uh, Sam Graft and Annabelle Aguirre were both summer interns with me, and they did most of the collect, or generated, I should say, most of the data I'll be talking about. Uh, Kiala and Josette are master students who are working with me, and in fact, I'm doing a virtual internship with Josette, or I should say, she's doing one with me this summer. Um, John Hess is a geneticist. I'll talk a little bit about him in a minute. And then really, the bulk of, of the data that I'll be showing comes from these fishery observers, and there's just some a uh, few photographs of, of current observers. These are people, employees, who go out on commercial fishing boats and sample the bycatch primarily, the things that they're discarding over the edge, and they go out there, and, and they're the ones who have collected the vast majority of the lamprey I'll be talking about today. Um, so just to think about lamprey, most people go, yuck, right? Uh, they've gotten a really bad rap because of what they've done to primarily salmonids in the Great Lakes where they're invaded. In fact, there's a movie called Blood Lake, which apparently is so bad it's become a cult uh, classic about this lake that's filled with lamprey. And I haven't, I've only seen pictures of scenes from the movie. It looked pretty bad. Um, but what I'd like to convince you is that lamprey are actually really, really cool animals. As my colleague Mary Moser says, they have the cutest little puppy dog eyes. I'm not sure I'd go quite that far, but uh, they are really amazing animals. Uh, and it's really what I, I want to convince you of today. And there's also that there's a lot we don't know about them. So today's talk, I'm going to talk about the biology and conservation of them, uh, talk a little bit about this new data we have of lamprey in the ocean, and then end with some summary and conclusions. And, Again, they're truly amazing creatures and need your help to survive another 400 million years. So let's start with life history and species. And lamprey dig nests. So here they are, or reds, uh, building a nest and, and getting ready to spawn. Um, first off, you should know is that lamprey are ancient. 
So this timeline, uh, I stole the idea of the Critic website, uh, shows that way back 450 million years ago, the first lamprey appeared in the fossil record. So these are the first fish. This is a full 100 million years before the age of the dinosaurs and about uh, 200 million years before the sturgeon, which are also a relatively primitive fish, showed up in the fossil record. Uh, six million years ago, by contrast, is when we saw the modern salmon, and then us humans have been around somewhere on the order of 100,000 years, so drop in the bucket. Uh, they truly are ancient fishes. So the west coast, surprisingly, of North America is home to almost a third of the worldwide lamprey uh, populations of which are species, I should say, there are I believe 38 and 11 of them are native. And there's apparently uh, probably some undescribed species on the West Coast as well. And they're still sorting out the, the biology of you know, it. And I just wanted to point out that uh, three of the species, uh, Pacific, Western River, Western River, and Arctic lamprey are anatomous. That means that they spend part of their life in freshwater where they spawn and rear for a while, then they go out into the ocean and gain most of their adult size, and then they come back. Um, and then or over half of the species of lamprey on the West Coast are parasitic. So they're feeding on the blood or the flesh of uh, fish and, and other animals to make their living. Uh, this map shows the distribution of some of the wi most widespread species. So Pacific uh, lamprey are by far the the most widespread of, of them. They go from uh, Southern California all the way up into Alaska and down the Asian side from Russia down to, I think they go to Hokkaido, Japan. Uh, there's two other species, Western Brook and Western River, which go from about Southeast Alaska down to uh, Monterey Bay or, or Central California. And these are our sister populations. So genetically, they're extremely similar to each other. Uh, up in Alaska, we have Arctic and Arctic Brook lamprey, which are also uh, sister species. And then there's a bunch of oddballs. So uh, a couple lakes on Vancouver Island or rivers have this Vancouver lamprey. The uh, Klamath Basin is full of a variety of lamprey. There's probably more species than, than are currently named. And then in the San Joaquin Valley of uh, the Central Valley, uh, there's this Kern lamprey. So it's uh, a huge amount of diversity. Uh, I'm a salmon biologist, and I always thought salmon had a pretty complex lifestyle cycle. They're an anatomists as well, but lamprey basically put them to shame. So they spawn, they lay their eggs, the eggs hatch, and they turn to these anaceids, which basically act like earthworms in the sediments of rivers. So they're consuming sediment and getting some nutritional value out of it. That stage lasts for anywhere from three to seven years. Then they metamorphize and they grow eyeballs in this uh, feeding disc. The anatomous ones then head out to the ocean anywhere from a few months to four years, depending on the species. They come back after having grown large, uh, spend a year in freshwater, and then spawn again. And they non anatomous lamprey, we know a lot less about the life cycle. We think it's more or less the same, but how long they're spending in different phases of it. I think we really don't have a good idea. A lot of this stuff is unknown. Uh, lamprey are, have significant cultural and ecological value. So the Pacific lamprey are an important and energy rich, easily harvestable and energy rich food. Uh, and they are very important to the West Coast tribes. This is a photograph showing lamprey on rocks in uh, at Willamette Falls, which is still a, a location where they're harvesting from way back in, in 1913. And there's uh, the tribes are the ones who have been really pushing hard that, hey, these lamprey are kind of going down the tubes and, and we need to pay attention and, and do something to protect them. And there's two different YouTube videos that I encourage you, if you haven't seen them, to watch them. Uh, one is why Pacific lamprey matter to the Columbia River Basin tribes. And the other is lamprey forgotten fish, and they're they're actually uh, cut from the same tape. But uh, it really makes an important point on why lamprey are so important to, to West Coast tribes. Um, so, uh, and these are some of the traditional uh, fish.
fishing sites for lamprey. So Saliva Falls uh, is now underneath, I believe it's the, da Dale, the Dallas Dam that was important for lamprey as well as catching salmon uh, while they were pulling up, getting ready to jump over, as well as all the way up in Kettle Falls, which is up where the Columbia, right before it flows north into Canada, or I should say it's flowing south, but uh, it's almost uh, near the border with Canada. It's hard to imagine that there were that many lamprey, that they were easy, easily harvestable that far from uh, the ocean, because this is now completely blocked by Grand Coulee Dam, Chief Joseph Dam. Uh, Lamprey also have a really large ecological value. They're ecosystem engineers because of this uh, earthworm-like mode of living when they're young, they recycle nutrients, they also clean gravels uh, when they're building their nests. They're also an energy-dense prey for a large variety of insects, fish, birds, marine mammal, predators in freshwater, in the estuarine environment, and also out in the ocean. And they're an important source of marine-derived nutrients, especially in streams without salmon. And this last point, the marine-derived nutrients, I think it's important to remember that barriers to lamprey are really different than barriers to salmon. In other words, lamprey can climb vertical walls, and so they can get in and fertilize with their bodies, and decomposing bodies, uh, areas that salmon cannot access. And, uh, perhaps Multinoma Falls is a bit of a, a leap, but I think you get the idea. Okay, so what is their status? Uh, threats and what are we doing about it? This is the status of Pacific lamprey, about which we know the most. Anything in dark red uh, is a, a tenth of a percent of historic abundance. The orange is 5% of historic abundance. You can see there's a lot of red and orange on that. Uh, it's a lot like salmon. The further inland or the further south you go, the worse shape they're in. And we can only assume that the uh, status of other lamprey species is probably as bad as these. We just don't know what's going on. Some of the threats, if you look at the lamprey life cycle, where you've got the spawning adults, the larvae in fresh water, they go out into the ocean. Uh, when they're in fresh water, some of the big threats are dewatering uh, and low flows, uh, poor water, water quality pollution, dredging, uh, degradation of streams and floodplains, and then predation by non-native fishes, things like uh, small and largemouth bass are known to be really voracious predators on the larval lamprey. As they're moving downstream and then back upstream from the ocean, passage is a huge issue, uh, dams, culverts, water division, diversions. Uh, when they're out in the ocean, ocean conditions, how much is available for them to, to feed on is a, a big threat. And then, of course, climate change it affects all stages of the life cycle. Uh, in the Columbia, one of the biggest things they've been doing is making lamprey-friendly dam or ladders at the dams. So there's fish ladders, but fish ladders have square corners, and lamprey cannot deal with square corners. They need rounded corners. So this is a picture of a lamprey uh, ladder at one of the dams, and these are resting boxes, and you can see all these nice rounded corners that you can get up. And this is looking inside. You can see the lamprey slowly climbing their way up. So they suck on and then do this big uh, movement with their bodies and, and let go for just a second and catch on again. It's, it's pretty cool to see. Other things they're doing, uh, they're screening of water diversions or water withdrawals. So lamprey, especially the young ages, can get through a very small hole if you're uh, taking water out of the river. They're transporting lam lamprey around the dams, so collecting them in the lowest Columbia River Dam and taking them way up uh, to areas where they, they uh, can spawn. There's artificial production going on to see vacant habitat, uh, ensuring it adequate in river flows, understanding habitat requirements, and then just even figuring out where are lamprey on the landscape. So there's a lot of work right now going on using eDNA, including here on the Kipquina River, uh, to sample and say, hey, are lamprey in the system or not? So, which is pretty cool stuff. Okay. So we're going to change gears and talk about this new stuff I've got on lamprey in the ocean. Um, and this is very much a work in progress. So uh, there's a lot of things we still don't know and a lot of data I, I haven't looked at quite in the right way. Um, so trying to figure out what the story is. But you might be asking yourself, well, why is lamprey important? Lamprey in the ocean important? And I think the point is, is that we hardly know anything about lamprey in the, in the ocean. And these very basic questions. 
we really don't have a good understanding. For example, what species are they parasitizing? How long do they stay there? Are they out there for six months? Are they out there for five years? How fast do they grow? Where do they go? Uh, what are survival rates? And perhaps the most important one is, has this marine phase contributed to these declining abundances coastwide? And, and therefore, what can we do about it? And you might think, why is NOAA Fisheries involved in this? And that's because NOAA Fisheries is uniquely positioned to increase our understanding of lamprey marine ecology because we regulate the fisheries that catch lamprey as bycatch. We employ observers, as I mentioned, on commercial fisheries who can sample the catch. Uh, and they have done a fantastic job and collected a huge number of lamprey for me for us. Uh, and then we also collect, conduct stock assessments and on from surveys that catch lamprey and their host. So there's huge sources of data that are uniquely available to NOAA fisheries on lamprey in the ocean. And I said lamprey, and I'm only going to show you Pacific lamprey, but we also have data for Western River lamprey as well, the other anatomous species in our waters. And I should just mention that, that a good lead in, I forgot the slide was here. Um, one of the big things that I, frustrations for me is that people are out on the ocean, don't always look and see what species of lamprey uh, they're dealing with or they've caught. And they're really easy to tell apart by the dentition. You can see that the, the uh, dentition on the, these lamprey are very different. And I unfortunately had to throw away some data because people didn't look to see. We know that Pacific lamprey get a lot bigger than river lamprey, but when they're kind of in the small size, uh, it could be either in many cases. And there's some other cases where I think actually people got the wrong species. They couldn't remember which was which. So important point. Okay, so what are the fisheries and surveys that catch lamprey? So there's two big fisheries uh, that I have samples from, and the observers on these fisheries have been catching, collecting uh, lamprey for me from them. One is the Axie Hake fishery, which is a midwater trawl. These are um, these big ships, these are processing uh, ships that go out there, catch lamprey, and process it on board. And then also the shrimp fishery. Uh, so it's a bottom trawl. These are relatively small boats that go out and catch Oregon pink shrimp. NOAA also runs three surveys that catch lamprey. So one is the Hake survey. It goes, it's this red line on the map. It goes from uh, almost southern Alaska all the way down to about Monterey. Uh, and they use a midwater trawl. They're trying to estimate how many hake are out there. Uh, and there's a big survey every other year in odd years. This purple line is the ground fish survey. So this is uh, uses a bottom trawl. They do the US Canada, the US Mexico border twice every summer. Uh, so a huge, huge effort. Uh, usually they use four, four different boats to do that. Uh, fortunately this year, there's no ground fish survey. And then finally, we have this green line is the juvenile salmon survey which is a surface trial. We just do it twice a year these days in May and June. It's on the shelf um, and goes from Cape Flattery, which is the very northern point in Washington, down here to Newport. Uh, and all, all of these are collecting uh, lamprey or seeing fish with lamprey marks. Now, you might see this prominence of hake to be wondering, what is this with hake? What are they? What do they do? Um, hake are I'm not going to try and pronounce the, the name, uh, scientific name, but they're also known as Pacific Whiting. These are the single largest fishery on the West Coast. The female spawning biomasses, just the females, doesn't count the males, is estimated to be 1.3 million metric tons. Uh, this past year, the harvest in 2018 was the highest on record with 400,000 metric tons, which was only two thirds or three quarters of the quota. And it is Marine Stewardship's Council certified because it's a relatively clean fishery. They're not fishing on the bottom, they fish midwater, which is where that when the hake come off, off of the, uh, the bottom. Uh, so it's a, a clean fishery. Uh, most people don't eat hake, and you would probably want to put it in your mouth if you could see that they're kind of ugly and they're kind of stinky. You don't mind my saying. Uh, they're pri primarily used for surimi, which is imitation crab meat and fish. Uh, but this massive, massive fishery. Okay, so what are the data and the samples that we've got? Uh, the first is whole lamprey, so that were collected uh, by these fisheries and surveys, uh, as well as historic uh, cash records. 
I've got data for a bunch of different things. I'm just going to talk about length, weight, and fatfulness. We've got fish with lamprey wounds, and there's a nice picture here of a widow rockfish. These big holes on the back are, are classic uh, lamprey wounds. Uh, I'll be talking about the species, but we've got other information as well. And then finally, where were these lamprey and wounded fish caught? And again, I'll be talking a little bit about latitude uh, and date. And basically, through this huge effort, we've assembled the world's largest collection of ocean caught Pacific lamprey, about 1,400 fish in total, and it's completely filling up my uh, minus 80 foot search. Need another one. This is just a picture showing you some of the lamprey, what they look like. These are defrosted, that's what they look kind of funny. Uh, here's a sharpie for scale. So this top one is one of the biggest ones we caught. I think it's over 700 millimeters. Uh, so you can you see the big, what I call adults, and then these little guys, uh, which are ones that we think have recently entered green waters. This is showing the data. Uh, so this is the date over here, all years combined, all uh, sources combined. I have the length, total length, and total weight over here. The little plus signs are all the uh, lamprey we've gotten from the hate fishery, that the observers on the hate fishery. You can see that's by far the biggest, I think 95% of the lamprey we've gotten have come from the hate fishery. The blue circles are from the shrimp fishery. Uh, these yellow dots are from the Hake survey. And you can see that they do the survey in between the two seasons for the Hake fishery and some other sources. Uh, the vast majority of the lamprey we have are small, less than 300 millimeters, 100 grams, and they're collected by the commercial Hake boats, the observers on the uh, commercial Hake boats. It is really surprising there are some uh, fish, lamprey from the ground fish survey, which are these uh, green triangles in here, but given how much effort they have, far more than any other survey, uh, it's actually relatively few, which is really interesting. Uh, there aren't a lot of lamprey from the juvenile salmon survey. There are these uh, red circles up here, but what's really interesting is that they seem to be catching a lot of large lamprey, and these are up on a, this is a surface trawl, uh, which is really unique. There, there are not very many of them. I think they've got 12 lamprey in 20, over 20 years of sampling, about 50 sets a year, um, but they're all big for the most part, which is really unique. Uh, one thing you can look at this data and say, wow, you know, maybe we're seeing different ages of lamprey out here. So I am kind of saying that these little guys are age zeros. They're in their first summer in the ocean. Uh, we have these intermediate sized ones that are age one. And then these big fish that are probably age twos or threes. And I, I say that based on the fact that these age zero fish are very, very similar to the size of uh, downstream migrating juveniles that are heading towards the ocean. And then these age twos and threes are the same size of the adults that are coming back. Um, it's interesting that there really aren't very many of these age one fish, which uh, somebody should ask me about when we get to questions. So I think there's some interesting stuff going on there. You notice that the age zeros are increasing in size over the uh, course of the summer, and this is just an example of what that looks like. So these are some lamprey that we caught in May, or that I should say the observers collected for me in May, and these are also lamprey that were collected in uh, October of the same year. And you can see the really dramatic increase in both size, uh, length, and weight. And with that, Looking at kind of the slope of this, these samples down here, we're able to calculate the first ever growth rate for Pacific lamprey. And it turns out that the growth in 2017 um, was actually higher than it was in 2018 for reasons I have absolutely no idea. Uh, but uh, these are pretty respectable growth rates. So uh, somewhere between a half and a third of a millimeter per day. Um, we also looked at gut fullness. So I call it gut fullness instead of stomach fullness because lamprey actually don't have stomachs, they just have guts. Uh, this is just showing the length across the bottom to spread the data out. And then this is the gut fullness as a, expressed as a percent of body weight. And you can see that most of the lamprey have kind of intermediate uh, gut fullness. So 6% body weight is the average. But some of these points up here are just incredible. I mean, we've got one here that's almost 60% of their body weight was uh, was due to their guts. And Sam's the one who uh, generated the first bit of data. 
um, I was totally blown away when he told me how high these gut fullnesses were. And I was kind of like, really? Is that true? And, and lo and behold, it is. So there's an example of a lamprey with one of these empty guts. So this is, if I can go back, this is one of these guys uh, down here. So they're big, but they, they don't have anything in their, their stomachs. And then here's one with an amazingly full gut. So they're really like pythons that have swallowed deers, as far as I can tell. Um, huge, huge uh, uh, ability to expand their guts when the feeding is really, really good. So, uh, this is the average gut fullness by the different sources. So we have the hay fishery, the ground fish survey, the hay survey, and the shrimp fishery. And it was really surprising that the hay fishery actually had the lowest uh, mean gut fullness of any of these sources. I thought it would be huge because they're, they parasitize hay, uh, they're caught together with hay. You would think they would all be stuffed uh, being out there, but that really didn't seem to be the case. And I, I should say these are standard deviations, and so there's probably no difference between these, but you would think that the hay fish caught in the hay fishery or the hay survey would be kind of off the charts for gut fullness. Uh, similarly, the fish that were caught by the shrimp fishery, we thought they'd be, have empty stomachs because we don't really think there's much when they're caught down on the bottom with the shrimp. They don't think there's many things that they can parasitize down there. Uh, instead, they had the highest level of gut fullness. And, and perhaps these are fat and happy individuals resting on the bottom. So they fell off of a hay and landed on the bottom. And they're just sitting there digesting. Uh, who knows? Kind of like most of us after Thanksgiving dinner. Okay, fishes with lamprey wounds. So I have probably the world's largest collection of pictures, photographs of uh, fish with lamprey wounds from the North Pacific Ocean. This is just an example of some of those. And you can see all of these guys have these telltale round marks, some or more uh, bigger and, and nastier than others. Uh, this is a big fin eel pout, which is really surprising to see uh, it had a, a mark on. One of the coolest photographs I got um, was this one. This is a ragfish, which is one of these bizarre, fairly uncommon fishes that are out there. Uh, and you can see these marks. So I put the, the picture of the Pacific lamprey dentition just so you can see, we call them happy faces, how it probably got on there moved over and then kept letting go and gripping on and then finally got to this area and then dug in. So you can see the, the wound there, but this is like so cool. If you don't think this is cool, then you should be in a different field. Uh, so what about, what did we see? This is the list of species that we've seen uh, with lamprey wounds. Uh, the things that are in black are new to science. Nobody had reported those before, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, as you might expect, the number of fish that I've seen that have lamprey wounds is highest in hake, uh, also high in widow rockfish and lingcod. And hake and widow rockfish are both caught by the hake fishery and the hake survey. And that makes sense. That's where we're getting most of the lamprey from. Um, but what is really interesting is that all these other species were caught by the ground fish survey, even though we don't see very many lamprey. Uh, in caught by the ground fish survey. And I should say, I don't think they're getting through the net. So they have a fairly uh, fine uh, liner in the, in the caught end of the ground fish survey net. Uh, so it's really interesting that kind of like, how did, what's going on here? If they're up in the water column, hanging out with a hake, how do they parasitize all these other species? Uh, one of these many questions. And there's also the issue of who eats who. So we know that lamprey have been found in the stomachs of several rockfishes, but we've also seen rockfishes that have lamprey wounds. And I think it's a pretty risky business when you think about it, parasitizing species that can eat you. So how do they get on there in time without get on the right end of the, the fish without getting eaten themselves? So it's kind of kind of tricky. And I would love to have some captive lamprey, put them in with some fish and see who, who ends up uh, with the better deal, shall we say. Okay, spatial distributions. Um, I was gonna, I'll show you the lamprey catches where we actually caught lamprey and then lamprey with fish wounds. And two of the questions I had were, are these lamprey congregated near the mouths of these big rivers? They're anatomists, they have to go back into the river to spawn and they came out of the river uh, where they were born to go to the ocean and feed. Uh, so are they, do they look like they're congregating in front of these big rivers? And then also how far south did they go uh, we know there are lamprey all the way down in Southern California, but we don't think there are very many down that 
far. So, so where, what do the patterns look like? And this is just showing here, uh, this is the distributions of the small lampreys, the, the, the big numbers that we've got, and then these large lampreys, anything over 300 uh, millimeters. And you can see that they're really widely distributed between Cape Flattery all the way down to kind of San Francisco Bay. Uh, a few more small ones, uh, I think this is just north of Point Arena. And then we actually have, for the large lamprey, one caught all the way down almost to the uh, US-Mexico border. So kind of down in LA. I mean, it was trying to go to Disneyland or something. But it, it's pretty impressive uh, how far south they really do go. Uh, it would be interesting to see if there's lamprey even further south down in Mexico. Uh, if you look at the fish with lamprey wounds on them, this is this uh, right hand graph is showing hate. So if I can get my thing to go up. Um, these are Pacific hate that were caught with lamprey wounds. You can see they're pretty widely distributed, about the same range as the lamprey themselves. And then these are other fishes. So uh, the blues are ring cod, the reds are widow rockfish, uh, and the Purple X's are other species, and again, we get uh, at least one lamp fish with a lamprey wound pretty far south, south of Monterey Bay, which is right here. So it's definitely pretty widely distributed for both of those. I think wider than anybody else, anybody ever thought. Uh, there are other projects that are going on with uh, ocean pot lamprey. These are all in progress. There's three we've got that are asking what have lamprey been feeding on, because that's one of the big questions we have is what are they really eating? So Louise and then Annabella was a root intern last summer. Uh, we were looking at using fatty acids to uh, explore what the what they look like, what they've been eating. These are uh, it's called using trophic biomarkers. Uh, Josette, who's at Hampton University, is doing the genetic analysis of gut contents. So she's basically using eDNA to try and understand what they're eating. And she just sent in the, I believe it was last week got interrupted by the hurricane. Um, they sent in the, the, they've now extracted DNA from the guts. They sent it to get uh, sequence, and she's waiting to find out what the answer is. So I'm very, very excited to hear what, what she gets. If it, if it really is hake, because um, most of the fish she's using were, came from the hake fishery, or maybe it's something else. And then Kiala has been using stable isotopes in the eye lenses to look at what they've been feeding. So stable isotopes are another trophic biomarker. The eye lenses, they put down layers like an onion, and she can look at different sets of layers uh, and see how uh, the stable isotopes change over time. Uh, the other question is that we're trying to address is where did lamprey originate from? So John Hess, who's with the Columbia River Tribal Inner Fish Commission, is a geneticist. He's uh, doing genetic analysis of the lamprey that we caught in the ocean. Uh, lamprey don't home nearly as well as salmon, so that you can't really tell exactly where they came from. But you can get some idea. And uh, he's developing some really exciting results. And then Kiala is also looking at satellite micro chemistry. So uh, these are the equivalent of otoliths, which are ear bones. They lay down daily layers. Uh, you can match up the microchemistry of the satellite to water samples in freshwater where you know what the geology is and try and see where did they come from. So all very, very exciting work and a good use of these. Okay, next steps. So we've got more lamprey. I just got three big bags from the 2020 uh, Hake fishery, and I'm supposed to get another bunch of bags uh, this fall. And what we'd like to do is, you know, compare it, have more years of data so we can look at the size, fullness, growth, distributions, et cetera, see how it changes it over time. Um, I mentioned this using trophic biomarkers to explore feeding histories. Uh, so Louise and I are hoping to do some more with fatty acids and stable isotopes to, to look kind of at the history of their feeding. Um, we're also pit tagging lamprey that were caught by the Hague survey. If they're in good shape when they come on the deck, we put a pit tag in them and then release them. And that's what this photograph is. This is actually an x-ray. They had an x-ray machine on board. This is the lamprey you can see by the gill arches. And this little white thing is a pit tag that they had injected in it. Um, the point of doing these is that the Columbia River is wired for pit tags. And so if you want to ascend most of the dams in the Columbia, they have pit tag detectors, and it will detect that tag. And uh, I haven't checked lately, but we've got five tags out there on lamprey, and I haven't seen any being detected yet. 
Uh, maybe they're going to some other river, not the Columbia, but I'm, I'm still hopeful. And then finally, I think it's really important to put this marine phase in the context of the entire life cycle to really understand how lamprey are making their living. And just an example of that is comparing uh, the condition factor of lamprey that are caught in the ocean and freshwater to understand what's going on. So this is just showing the length here. And this is condition factor, which is a ratio of the weight to the length of the fish. So things up with big numbers are fat. They weigh a lot for a given length. Things with low numbers are skinny. And these purple squares are these marine collections that I've got. I just took an average across uh, different groups of fish. I think these are the, the different ocean ages. Um, and then all the ones down here are freshwater collections. Um, so you can see for the little guys that are heading on their way to the ocean, they're really, really skinny compared to uh, similar sized fish that we caught out in the ocean. And same with these uh, larger fish. So these big guys in the ocean are pretty big compared to uh, fish that adults that are caught in fresh water, which makes sense of sorts because they are stop feeding once they get back to fresh water. And this triangle right here is actually one of uh, uh, fish that was caught in the Columbia River estuary. Uh, basically, this says that these guys are pulps. Uh, marine caught fish really weigh a lot for a given length compared to anything you see in fresh water. And this is really important that, you know, kind of understand what is the role of, of the ocean for lamprey. Clearly, they put on a lot of weight and put on a lot of energy. Okay. So summary and conclusion, I hope I have convinced you that lamprey are truly amazing. There's a huge conservation effort for Pacific lamprey uh, to address the threats. We know very, very little about other lampreys, including whether we really even know how many species are out there, uh, let alone their abundance, their status, et cetera. These new ocean samples and effort is greatly increasing our knowledge of marine ecology of lamprey. So we. For example, we know that most lamprey are small, likely in their first summer in of marine waters. They're growing rapidly. Uh, we've increased our understanding of what hosts they're parasitizing, which appear to be hate, but uh, they also appear to be opportunistic when they can. Um, and the gut fullness is really puzzling. It's not what we expected at all. Uh, we think the position of the water column is mainly midwater, so they're hanging out with the hate in midwinter, less frequently on the bottom, and very rare near the surface, but not, uh, we saw those big lamprey in the juvenile salmon surveys that were caught in surface crawls. So, and they're also widely distributed in the ocean. Uh, they don't appear to be congregated near river mouths, either when they're young or uh, adults, which is also really interesting. And there's a whole lot more to learn. So with that, I will show you, this is another of my favorite pictures. Uh, There's a wonderful one taken by one of the observers on the fishing vessel ocean rover, which I call still life with lamprey. And with that, I will open it up for questions. So each time I cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Should I just? Can you hear me now? Hmm. Very interesting. Okay. Um, I think I might go into the other room, but if folks could put okay. questions in the chat. So, Charlie, Char Chantel, Chantel. Says, you mentioned some lamprey live on the ocean floor. Uh, is there over with black with hagfish? Um, that's a good question. My understanding is that hagfish live quite a bit deeper. So, hagfish are the other jawless fish. So, lamprey are jawless, and I have jaws. Uh, the primitive fish, hagfish are the other ones. Hatfish are really scavengers on the ocean. My understanding is they're, they're out really deep. They're on the kind of the abyssal plain. Um, whereas I think that the lamprey tend to be more on the uh, continental slope. Uh, but that is a, a really good I, uh, question. And, and I don't, don't entirely know. Other questions. So can I share, uh, if I know I have a traditional ecological knowledge about lamprey, um, 
I do not know uh, specifically that much about it, but I know that there is a huge amount of, of traditional ecological knowledge associated with lamprey. Uh, we've been, we have a marine lamprey group that we uh, talk quarterly, and one of the members is a guy from the Europe tribe uh, in Northern California, and he said there's like night lamprey and day lamprey, and that he's found genetically that those two groups are actually different. Um, and I think it's partially the, let's see if I can get this right, uh, is when they're reproducing. There's the, if you know salmon, there's spring, like spring, spring chinook and fall chinook. So spring chinook come in at one time with, uh, they're sexually immature and they stay in fresh water and then eventually uh, their eggs ripen and they spawn, whereas fall chinook come in and, and immediately spawn. And it sounded like it was something analogous uh, in lamprey that is, is traditional knowledge uh, I, I'm sure there's a ton of other stuff, and I'm just not that familiar with it, but it, it is a huge source, and it's really cool that the tribes have been so involved in uh, lamprey management and conservation because they can then spread this, and, and they are doing it. I haven't been directly uh, involved in that. Another question is, what is the latest knowledge on river lamprey? Uh, so river lamprey are really cool. Uh, I have a nice paper on that came out in fisheries biology uh, or fisheries bulletin it, on lamprey in the Columbia River lamprey in the Columbia uh, Columbia River estuary, and we really don't know very much about them at all. One thing that's unique about them, they're lampetra species, uh, which is different than Pacific lamprey, which are enterosphenus, I believe. Um, is that they eat the flesh. They don't eat the blood. They eat the flesh. And so when you see fish that have lamprey marks on them from Western River lamprey, it, it looks like somebody's been nibbling along the back and they can get these really gnarly wounds on them. Um, but we really don't have a good idea of where they are, you know, how many there are, et cetera, uh, because most people don't think that if you're going to catch a lamprey, it's going to be a Pacific lamprey. And that's really not the case. Uh, so I think there should be a concerted effort, and uh, at least in Oregon, Ben Clemens is the guy to talk to. He's the, the state lamprey coordinator uh, about what is going on. But they are a very cool species and, and really understudied and under, understood well. So am I familiar with the US Fish and Wildlife campaign on lamprey, the Luna lamprey? I am a little bit. So uh, even though lamprey are anatomous because they spend most of their life cycle in freshwater, US Fish and Wildlife Service has been the ones that the federal agency that is uh, really spearheading the conservation effort uh, of lamprey. And they have Luna lamprey, who is their uh, mascot, shall we say. There's also uh, an exhibit at the Portland Zoo on lamprey, and they have apparently a bunch of uh, Pacific lamprey in, in tanks there that, that are really cool. I did not get an opportunity to go see the uh, exhibit. It opened last winter before uh, I couldn't go anymore, so it was cool. Okay, I've been doing size class analysis on Eupagevia with John Chapman size class analysis i have not um uh yeah and i would that's something i need to do is to look and see what the um, formally look at the different sizes but given the numbers and how close the little guys are that we see to uh, the size of lamprey when they first entered the ocean uh, i think that they're first summer what's really interesting though actually the little bit of fatty acid I should say, should say little, but the fatty, some of the fatty acid data that Annabella and Louise generated last summer, um, I, freshwater systems have very different signatures, fatty acid signatures than marine systems. And so I said, one of the things I wanted to know with fatty acids is do these lamprey look like they just came from freshwater? You can do that with fatty acids. And it turned out the answer is no, they don't look like freshwater at all. So they've been here for a while. So uh, sometimes we think that generally uh, the juveniles move or the anisets move downstream with freshets either in the winter or early in the spring. 
Um, and so these guys, the earliest pink fisheries occur in about May. And so potentially it's a couple months, which is usually about the amount of time it takes to turn over uh, things like fatty acids and have them reflect what's going on. Okay, I mentioned, Kiala is asking, I mentioned theories on when the year one fish are smaller, fewer of them, can I elaborate? And I can, if I can get back to this. So what Kiala, oh, I can't go backwards. There we go. So what I was mentioning is that there are hardly any of these age one fish. You would think that if you have a, this many age zero fish, then some lesser number but uh, of age ones and then even fewer age twos and threes. But in fact, these age ones, there's hardly any of them compared to what you would think there would be. And I actually think that they're going up to Alaska. So we think that they, I think that they leave the area and this is uh, there's two pieces of evidence for this. One is that John Hess, when he looks at fish that ocean caught lamprey that have siblings that we know were sampled in freshwater, so we know where they came from. If you go look at those groups, they disappear in the fall, so they seem to leave the area. And these are age, primarily age zero fish. That, that it looks like they're they're actually leaving the area. The other evidence. Uh, which is two more pieces of evidence. One is that up in Alaska, on the Alaska Fisheries Bering Sea Slope Survey, they catch a ton of lamprey, Pacific lamprey, and they're big, they're good sized lamprey. I've got two of them uh, in my freezer, and they're, they're kind of in the, I think they're both about 400 millimeters. Um, and there aren't really big lamprey, Pacific lamprey populations in Alaska, so the question is where do these things come from? Because there, there are tons of them up there. Um, and then the final piece of evidence is that there's a Russian, Alexei Orlov, who was given a bunch of pit tags to put in lamprey that he caught in the Western Bering Sea. So he's Russian examples there. And he put these lamprey, pit tags in lamprey. And one of them got detected going over Bonneville Dam and then ended up detected again in the Deschutes River. So we know that that fish came from the western Bering Sea off the coast of Russia and swam all the way down and went up the Columbia River. Uh, so I think that these, the reason we don't see very many age ones is that they have gone somewhere else to be where it's better. And which is pretty amazing, they're really going up to the Bering Sea because they, they just don't look like they could swim very well, but perhaps they swim a lot better than they think they can. So, okay, other questions or is that? Have I eaten lamprey? I have not had the opportunity to eat lamprey yet. Uh, there was a field trip to Willamette Falls when they were harvesting uh, lamprey. Uh, the Warm Springs do that and I missed that field trip because I was busy doing something else and apparently people were offered lamprey. Um, it's very oily is all I can say, uh, but I would love to try it. Uh, it's on my bucket list of things that I'd like to do. Okay, do I think Lamprey are actively feeding on the shrimp fishery in the water column or off the bottom? Uh, are they feeding on sinking shrimp detritus? So the shrimp that we're talking about that are being caught by the shrimp fishery are those little tiny cocktail shrimp. These are Oregon pink shrimp. Uh, they're you know half an inch long. I don't think they're eating those. And they don't, uh, if you look at all the literature, ODFNW has some great stuff on uh, pink shrimp and what is caught with the pink shrimp. Um, and there, there really isn't anything that looks like it would be good uh, lamprey prey or, or some species that they're parasitizing. And they're eating blood. I should probably shouldn't have said that um, when I said they're parasitizing. They really do eat the blood. And so I don't think they're eating detritus. Uh, Dan Kamakawa is one of the people who's uh, involved in this project, who's an amazing. Uh, person knowing what goes on out in the ocean. And he said, where you catch shrimp are tends to be these muddy holes and there's not a lot else there. Uh, so we really are puzzled what, what is going on with those, those fish that we're catching in the shrimp fishery. Why are they there? And why do they have such high stump holes? Who knows? Okay, are any more questions, questions. from uh, folks online? 
Uh, okay, so, uh, well, um, I want to thank you, Lori, for uh, your seminar presentation today. Um, and thanks. Right. Well, you. thank you very much for uh, watching my presentation with great questions. And yes, thank you, Joseph. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And uh, uh, please come join us next week uh, for our, our next seminar speaker.